So, um, good afternoon, everybody, and I apologise if you were expecting Kevin. I'm not Kevin. Um, so, I work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, where I am a senior lecturer. I'm also the director of ArcTech, which is the Arthropod Control Product Test Centre, which is a commercial venture at the London School, where we run clinical trials on insect repellents, uh, afterbite treatments, insecticides, we run trials in the field and in the laboratory, uh, and also head lice treatments as well. Um, we do have a stand actually up in the foyer, so if you'd like a leaflet or any more information about the services that we provide at the school, then do come and talk to us, and some of my team are also wandering around uh, the place today as well. But what I'd like to talk to you about today, and I did get asked to do this uh, yesterday afternoon, so I've put some slides together last night. It's a bit of a mishmash, so I do apologise if it doesn't flow very well, but I didn't have a lot of time. But what I thought is I'd give you a bit of an overview of some of the work that we've been doing um, in my research group at the London School um, into novel control strategies for vector insects. And there are two main themes that I want to talk about. One is the interaction between insects and the pathogens they carry and us. And the other thing I want to talk about is mechanisms that are involved in the processes of, um, of how control products might work or, um, or how insects actually find us in the first place. Now, the, one of the best places to start is probably the interaction with us. How do insects find us in the first place? Well, they're attracted to chemicals, semiochemicals given off by our bodies, as well as heat and, and visual cues and, and moisture as well. But semiochemicals, behavior-modifying chemicals, are probably the most dominant sense or the most dominant cue used by mosquitoes to find us. One of the things I commonly get asked is, why is it that I always get bitten by mosquitoes? Or why does that annoying person over there never get bitten? And that's not me, because I'm really attractive to mosquitoes. Um, and I'm sure all of you have encountered this at some point. So we did a study to look at this, and we, um, we, we took some volunteers and we tested how attractive they were. Now, this was in a laboratory situation. We inserted their hands inside an olfactometer, which allowed us to measure the behavioral response of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes to the volatiles coming from their hands. And the results of this experiment are up here. And what you can see very basically is that we have some very attractive people here that attract lots and lots of mosquitoes and some very unattractive people. And these people actually stick out quite a lot. In fact, this guy here, Y04, this is, this is one of my friends who claims he never gets bitten by mosquitoes, and we, we tested it, and it's true, he doesn't. We took him to the west coast of Scotland as well to do some field trials up there. And um, the whole time we were there, we were there for about a week, we got about, I don't know, two or 300 bites. If you've ever been to the west coast of Scotland, you'll know about the Scottish biting midge. It is a real pain. You put your hand here, and sometimes you can't even see it because there are so many. Now, we got hundreds of bites during that time. This chap, Y04, my mate, uh, had one, one bite, and it was on his thumb in that whole time, which is quite incredible. So there is something going on, something really quite potent in our odor that, that causes mosquitoes and other biting things to, to leave us alone and to, to not be attracted to us, despite the presence of the attractants, including carbon dioxide, that we all produce. So we decided to look at this um, using chemical ecology studies, and we, we now have um, a whole chemical ecology suite at the London School. Um, we extracted body odor by placing people inside thermal survival bags. It's quite a bizarre looking experiment, but it's very effective, and we could extract body odor uh, using this method. Then what we do is rather neat. We connect microelectrodes to the antenna of the insect, and that allows us to measure the, the electrical response of the receptors on the antenna to individual compounds within a complex mixture of human body odor. This is what human body odor looks like. All these peaks are different chemicals. Um, when we put this into a GC, that's what it looks like, a gas chromatograph, which separates the chemicals into their individual components. When we connect that to an antennal preparation of the insect, you get the response of the GC, which tells us what the chemical might be, and a response of the insect's antenna. And where these peaks match, for example, here, we know that the insects are detecting those chemicals. It doesn't tell us what they do. So later on, we had to then do behavioral tests to find out whether these chemicals were attractants or repellents. And what we found was that some of them were attractants, but some of them were also repellent. And in fact, the only difference we saw between our attractive and unattractive people were that people who were unattractive and not being bitten were producing extra 
chemicals, additional chemicals which had this repellent effect. We then went on to test these chemicals. Um, this is in the laboratory. This is actually with Anopheles Gambia this time. And we tested uh, a particular ratio of these chemicals to see how, uh, how mosquitoes would react to those. And what we actually found was that at a 10% and a 1% concentration, that's actually quite a low concentration, even for DEET, but you do achieve 100% repellency with DEET, which was the control, uh, our reference product, and also with the, the chemicals that we identified from humans. And actually, when you go down to even lower concentrations, these are at concentrations where you can't smell these chemicals at all, you still have a significant effect. And in fact, DEET drops off quite dramatically, which is the red bar, whereas these chemicals remain active, and even down at this 0.001% solution, um, you still have significant repellent activity. Over time, if we formulate this, we've, we've done some very simple formulations by putting it into a, a very simple wax um, sort of formulation. Um, it can maintain longevity up to around two hours, and then it starts to drop off. Um, so it is a bit of a formulation issue. The chemicals are very volatile. Um, that's a good thing because... Um, they also, we've also shown that they, react, that they act spatially. So we can, we can dispense them into the environment um, and cause spatial repellency. So you might imagine having this in a household, for example, dispensing the chemicals and keeping the mosquitoes away um, in this respect. It's a challenge, though, for topical repellency because we need a, an appropriate formulation to keep the chemicals on the skin for long enough. Moving on from this, we've done a little bit uh, more work in this area because... It became apparent that people used, would tell us that, um, you know, I, I always get bitten, my son or daughter always gets bitten, and so we thought, well, this would be something interesting to look at. And we did a study um, on the west coast of Scotland again, there was a triathlon going on, and we asked people about their interaction with biting midges whilst they were in an area with biting midges. And one of the things that came out significant was that people seemed to claim that their offspring uh, were more or less attractive similarly to, um, to their parents. So that suggested that there might be a genetic trait for being unattractive. Um, there's some evidence in the literature that twins, for example, smell very similar to each other. So potentially that, the, the odors could be involved. Um, and also there's, a, there's some evidence that um, twins can be similarly attractive to mosquitoes as well, but based on questionnaire data. Um, we've taken this one step further. We're halfway through a study now where we've which is funded by the, the High Stewart Trust, and we have recruited a whole load of um, identical and non-identical twins. So the London School is a little bit of a funny place at the moment with lots of twin, sets of twins walking around. Um, and what we're doing is we're measuring their attractiveness, and we're looking to see whether um, our uh, identical twins are more similarly attractive or repellent um, than non-identical twins. So watch this space. Um, we are getting some interesting results, and I'm sure we'll publish those results um, fairly soon. Another thing that we're doing in this area, actually, is trying to work out how the body produces these natural repellents. And we've done some work by culturing uh, sebocytes, which are skin cells in culture, and if we feed them the appropriate precursor, we can actually make those cells produce these natural repellents. So we think we know how the repellents are being produced, if we know that there's a genetic link as well and we identify which genes may be involved in the upregulation of these repellent compounds, you might even, in the future, think about a drug perhaps that even exists already that you could take that would, enhance, that would cause the body to enhance the production of natural repellents, potentially a new way of, of using repellents or keeping mosquitoes away from us. In a similar way, we also work on attractants. Um, we're doing a, a very similar study, but this time with cattle and sheep um, on the vectors of blue tongue, Culicoides midges, the same ones that you get in Scotland. And we do a similar thing. We put these animals inside a box this time rather than a bag. It's a bit more difficult to get a sheep or a cow inside a thermal survival bag, but they stand quite happily inside this box. And we extract the odors and measure how attractive different breeds are as well. And doing this, we've identified um, several new attractants which haven't been identified before for any biting insects, and we're now developing those lures and, and testing them against other species uh, as well. Another thing to consider in these types of um, experiments and thinking about the biology and ecology of these insects is what happens when these insects are infected, and quite often those that are infected 
are the ones that were really in, except nuisance biting. Those are the ones that we're interested in. Now, there's some evidence that mosquitoes that are infected with malaria parasites will bite more frequently. They'll bite, they'll probe more often, so that there's some sort of behavioral change. Now, with the importance of the olfactory system, we wondered whether infection caused some sort of change in the olfactory system as well. And so we did a preliminary study with Anopheles gambian mosquitoes, which were infected with um, uh, falciparum malaria. And in fact, this study has now been funded fully by the BBSRC, and we have a, a three-year project running at the London School in our Category 3 laboratories. And what we found is that mosquitoes that were infected at the sporozoic stage when the parasite is transmissible to uh, human beings, they respond significantly more to human odor. So they're more attracted significantly to human odor than those that are uninfected, which suggests the parasites are altering the olfactory system of the mosquito. We don't understand how yet. We don't understand which part of the system is being affected. And that's what we're going on to study um, in our lab now. Another aspect of this as well is how, when we have malaria parasites, are we altered in some way, which then affects the transmission of the parasite. And in fact, there's some preliminary evidence from other publications that show that people who have malaria are more attractive and due to, to odor at the point at which the parasite is transmissible between us and the mosquito. So we have a, a, another project um, in collaboration with uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands where we are um, collecting orders from people who are being experimentally infected um, at a hospital in Nijmegen with malaria and also um, collections from, from um, subjects in Kenya who have a natural infection of malaria to determine whether there are any um, changes in, in how attractive they are. Again, it's at an early stage, so I don't really have any results that have been analyzed to, to show you there. But with these studies, the intention really is to identify, not only to understand this process and understand the transmission dynamics, but also to identify potentially new attractants that we can use in traps and potentially even target malaria-infected mosquitoes, which may enhance surveillance um, in the future. With all of this information, we could put it together. If you were in the repellent workshop earlier, we heard about the push-pull control strategy, which has been used successfully in Africa in the agricultural world. But for animals and for human beings and, and diseases spread by vector insects, we could use this approach as well, potentially, um, where we use repellents um, or chemicals which keep the insects away from the host uh, and attractants which pull them into, into traps. This is a potential uh, way of, uh, of controlling insects. It's not really been demonstrated to any great extent in the field yet, but there are studies underway uh, actually looking at this, and it's a very exciting area. But one thing we need to do is get some very good repellents. Again, we discussed this earlier, um, and spatial repellents are probably going to be one of the, the important parts of this. We need to identify really good spatial repellents. Um, very briefly, I just want to talk about the second uh, theme of my talk, which was to do with um, understanding the mechanisms underlying responses of insects. And this time we're going to focus on not the natural, really the natural interactions, but more the interactions with us when we use uh, control uh, technology. And that technology uh, that I'm going to talk about is DEET, diethyltoluamide, synthetic chemical, one of the best repellents on the market. Um, I'm sure we've all used it at some point. Um, Remarkably, DEET has been around for, well, it's been around since the 1940s, the late 1940s. Um, yet we still don't really understand how it works. Lots of studies have been done recently, including studies in our lab that we published recently in PNAS, where people have looked at the olfactory system and they've shown that DEET interacts with olfactory receptors that are tuned into attractants. So it sort of blocks the receptors for things like 1-octin-3O, which is a host-derived cue. In our lab and in other labs, what they've also shown is that mosquitoes have, have receptors that can detect those chemicals actively. Um, and so we wanted to investigate this in our lab um, to find out whether mosquitoes did have receptors that could detect DEET, and also to find out if mosquitoes were exposed um, to DEET. What you tend to find is that there will always be one or two mosquitoes that will bite you despite the presence of DEET, and despite the presence of anything that's very good, they'll, they'll sort of overcome it. And are they able to, to pass that trait on? Are they, is that, are they able to become, in effect, resistant to, uh, to DEET? So we did an experiment in the lab. 
Um, we selected mosquitoes. So we, you can see with our strain, we had around 10% of mosquitoes would bite despite the presence of DEET. When you selected those that still bit you despite the presence of DEET, and you bred them with normal males from the colony, um, this level of insensitivity shot up, and it shot up to around 60%. So in one generation, you got them being te from 10% insensitive uh, up to around 60%. That trait was maintained in the population over successive generations. Even when you stopped selection and then, did, and then retested them, that trait was still there. So it was fixed in the population, and we think it's a dominant um, trait. When you look at the receptors for this, what we found was that insensitive mosquitoes were responding significantly less to DEET. So the olfactory system was certainly involved. And um, you can see that here, where we have a control on the sensitive line, no response. This is the response of the receptor. Um, and this is the response of the receptor on the sensitive line to DEET. The control on the insensitive line, and then the response of the insensitive mosquitoes to DEET. So there is no response here. So these receptors are clearly involved in this. We can take it down even further than that and we can identify the, the subtype of the olfactory sensory hair that, that the, the mosquitoes are, are using and they're being altered by this. And we can even identify the olfactory receptor neuron specifically that uh, is altered during this process, during this insensitivity. <clears throat> Slightly more worrying um, is that, so we can see this is a heritable trait. When we did some studies looking at the short-term effects of DEET as well, what we found in our laboratory test was that if you subject mosquitoes to DEET and then test them three hours later with DEET again, significantly more mosquitoes will bite you, um, which suggests that some sort of habituation is going on, some sort of behavioral modification in, sh in the short term that's not genetically controlled is also happening with DEET. So there are all these things that we need to really understand about control technologies that we have currently available to us, and that includes insecticides and behavioral reactions to insecticides, not just DEET. Um, and what's actually happening mechanistically um, and in terms of how uh, they can overcome them as well before we put some of these technologies out um, and use them as vector control interventions. Um, with repellents, they're not really used at the moment, but if they are to be used in the future, we need to know this stuff before they go out and find ways to overcome them or come up with new technologies. Very briefly, we've also just published a paper where we looked at um, essential oils as repellents and found that there was a significant correlation between um, P450 inhibition, which is an enzyme, which we think is present in the antenna of the insect and is used in sort of mopping up the chemicals uh, that enter through the an antenna and causes some sort of behavioral confusion in the insect. And we're going on to do more work in that, but potentially that's a new mechanism um, for how repellents work. All of this information could lead to developing um, a, a, a high throughput screening process to identify new active ingredients. Now, you might question, do we actually need new active ingredients? And that's certainly a point for discussion uh, maybe later on. But um, what we can do is we can express um, mosquito olfactory receptors in vitro and create a cell panel and then pass over lots of chemicals to identify very rapidly which ones would be detected by the mosquito and, and are likely to be repellents, giving a very high throughput um, screening process. And then we would go on and use the insects themselves, obviously at the behavioral level and the electrophysiological level to determine how these uh, chemicals actually work and then leading to, um, to a product in the end. So just in summary, um, We've described uh, the, some of the work that we're doing in terms of identifying um, new repellents and attractants um, for vector control. Um, and there is, there is evidence that repellents can be used to reduce disease transmission. There is evidence there, but there's also evidence that it does nothing at all. And really, we don't know enough. And we've, we spoke about this earlier in the workshop. Um, there's a lot more to be done in this area. And we need to be sure that when we do carry out these big field trials, that we're doing it with the right interventions, that we're choosing the right products and that the study design is appropriate. That's really, really important because the last thing we want to do with the technology like repellents or attractants is to show again that they don't work just because we got it wrong in terms of the methods or the, or the technology itself. Um, we can use um, the mechanisms or understanding the mechanisms underlying 
how insects interact with us and the pathogens they carry, um, and also control technologies to identify new active ingredients, um, and also identify places where technologies may fail before they actually fail. And something that I didn't have time to talk about as well is, is other new ways to use or, or, or ways to use current uh, vector control technology. So for example, in our lab, we have a study looking at impregnated clothing as an intervention against uh, dengue transmission in school children in Thailand. Um, and it's very simple, it's a very simple idea, but nobody's really looked at that. Um, and so we have a study where we're investigating the effects in the laboratory at the fine scale of the behavior of the insects in, in response to permethrin um, and finding some very interesting things there that will lead on to, to a field trial in Thailand where we'll actually look at whether this intervention has a, an effect on disease transmission. Similarly, we're looking at insecticide-treated blankets which might be used in combination with insecticide-treated bed nets before people get under their, their bed, for people who don't use bed nets or don't like to use them or they put their children under there instead. Um, so there are interventions out there. I'd like to see potentially repellents being incorporated into fabrics as well um, to see whether we can enhance the effect of, um, of permethrin, for example. So lots of things that already exist that we don't quite understand and we could utilize um, a little bit better. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there and I hope I've given you a bit of a, some food for thought anyway on, on certainly on some of the things that we do in in my lab. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge, I'm not going to read through this list, these are all the guys in my lab at the London School working for Arctech or as part of my research group and PhD students. Um, some of the pictures are there, you'll recognize some of them, they're mostly sitting over there and looking uh, quite sort of, well, laughing now. Um, and, uh, and all these uh, institutions that we collaborate with and funding agencies as well. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>